Hi, hello everyone. Welcome back to Latin American Directions. My name is Nicholas Suzman from the wonderful city of Bogota, Colombia. And today we have a stellar guest, Alvaro Jose Salgado. Alvaro is a Colombian lawyer. He has participated and supported several political campaigns for Congress and the President's Office in Colombia. And now he exercises in his free time as political analyst. Alvaro, thank you so much for being here and welcome to Latin American Directions. Hello, Nicolas. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Alvaro Salgado. As Nicolas said, I work, I have worked previously in several campaigns uh, in the Congress on the presidency. And um, well, uh, thanks, for, thanks for, for being here and, and let's start. Great. Alvaro, at the beginning of this month, we held our legislative elections, I would say, in a very complicated and uncertain political context. Uh, Colombia, for as far as I remember, perhaps the last 10 years has been very polarized. But now is the first time we see that the left uh, has a significant outcome a significant victory even in the legislative elections uh, what could you tell us about that well i think the the sadly the country has come to a to a really um complex situation in the current elections uh, i think uh, it's not because of the left had have an, a, a successful result in the congress elections we we held two weeks ago but rather because the people and the country is going and is buying the populism uh, speech that took over the United States. Whether it is from the right or whether it is from the left, we are currently under a populist right government, which is the government of, of Ivan Duque and, and, and Alvaro Uribe, the previous president. And the country is right now tired of the right populist speech, the right populist poor results in the economy in the social challenges that the country has and is looking over another populist speech that have been able to um, interpret and have been able to um, listen to the people's needs. And sadly, the country is right now wanting to more populism, but from another ideological aspect. And I think that's the, the risk of the situation. It's not that the left have obtain good results in the election rather than the country is wanting more populism and deep to deepen in that dangerous road for democracy. Right, uh, Alvaro, in last shows, and I think that is something that we see in all our region is the speech about left and right. And with several guests, we have discussed that maybe that is not the best categories to interpret the region, right? And to interpret politics, economics, uh, in the region. What do you say about that? Regarding the, the left and the right speech, I think that's, uh, that's uh, an ideology or, uh, or yeah, like a speech we need in the region to overcome in order to uh, set our priorities straight regarding what kind of society do we want? Do we want a society that hugs the principles of democracy, the principles of law and order? Or do we want a democracy that hugs the principles of populism, of personalism in, 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 in the political uh, arena and uh, this institutionalization of the countries? We've seen through the region political projects such as the Hugo Chavez project in Venezuela or the Kirchner uh, projects in Argentina that have turned into, not into a, um, an institutionalized democratic left project rather than a populist left self-centered project that have broken law and order broken economy in their countries all just to satisfy the leaders ego and the leaders um style and the leaders uh self-given through right right uh and and, and taking that self-centered uh style of politics. Let's speak about perhaps the two or the three main candidates uh, that we see here. Uh, Federico Gutierrez Fico from the right, Gustavo Petro from the left, and I would let you choose the one you like from the center. <laughs> Tell us a bit okay. about, about that, how you see it, the pros and the cons, the risks of each one of them. Perfect. Well, uh, starting with Federico Gutierrez, the, the, 
we might say he is the candidate of 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 the same government and the same political project. Uh, it has ruled Colombia over 20 years. So Federico Gutierrez is basically more of the same. The people is tired of is more of the same right authoritarianism, more of the same improvisation and unexperience that we have lived through this president, through, through this current president. And of course, it embraces um, a broken speech of defending freedoms and liberties uh, only when it benefits the ideological aspects of the right. For example, in, in, the, in the Federico Gutierrez case, all the campaign he's doing right now is defending liberties, but when he's asked about LGBTQ communities' liberties, uh, women's rights and women's liberties, his positions are sadly the same positions that we've seen during 20 years in the Colombian government. Positions of, of restriction of liberties, positions of discrimination. Uh, on the left, and uh, the, the man of the hour, if we may say it, is Gustavo Petro. The left candidate, he, he was uh, Bogota's mayor, and then he ran for president. This is, I think, his third time running for president. He started as an institutionalized, democratic, good intention left, proposing the country back in 2005, maybe with the Polo Democratico Alternativo, the political party, uh, a different way of, of, of governing, uh, respecting law. However, he's a, a self-centered person, a very authoritarian person, and close people to to his uh, Bogota's government say say that they they even couldn't work with him in the in the in the Bogota in the Bogota government because he's a self-centered uh, authoritarian person that likes that things are done his way and his way only. He of course has seen, and I think his strategy to win the presidency right now is really based on the Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador strategy in Mexico. Uh, he is standing on a populist base. He's talking about um, breaking with the central bank independence. He's talking about uh, making um, a national constitutional assembly in order to change everything, which of course it sets a really, really high risk to the Colombian economy of failing into the same um, wrong practices that Argentina has 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 uh, implemented and and that have them in this basically a, a, yeah deficit. So there's a risk there to economy. There's a risk there to the institutionalization of Colombia that we have we have uh, struggled to get. And in the center, sadly, I think is Sergio Fajardo, the former mayor of Medellin, the second largest city in Colombia. Um, he was really, really a, an important campaign back in 2018. He, he, wake or, or he, he, he was seen as hope among young voters, among independent voters, among among those that hug democracy and institutions and liberties as the main um, pillars of, of the country. But sadly, his project has failed totally in these elections. His speech hasn't been able to connect with people. He's not interpreting the needs of people, the, the rage that people have uh, be, uh, after COVID, after being poor, after having to starve because they have no, no work. So sadly, his project is, is failing right now. His, his, his proposals to the country of a democratic institutionalized transition and change are not connecting with people because, because people is angry and people want a radical change that led them um, get out of poverty, that let, they, let them get a job. And, and he, he's the third option to the presidency, but I think it's really hard that he, he actually can win the election. Right, right. And uh, well, that, I think the key question here, and, and I think we could take it from what you're saying, but who do you think will win the election? Well, I mean, we, we have seen the, the Congress results, but basically Gustavo Petro and the Pacto Historico, his, his new political platform, they have taken the majority of the Congress. They have taken 20 senators and around 30 uh, um, congressmen, 30 representatives. Um, 
that's a huge, huge, huge uh, news in Colombia because it's the first time an alternative uh, force gets that, that many votes and gets that many seats in Congress. Um, I think the only way Gustavo Petro can, can be president is uh, if he goes to the, um, to the second round of the elections with Federico Gutierrez, that is the candidate of the, of the current government. In other scenarios, such as, such as Sergio Fajardo, I think Sergio Fajardo will win the presidency. But for me, it's practically a given that Gustavo Petro is going to be the next president of Colombia. Right, and what could, could we expect from that presidency? Well, it's, it's really hard to, to, to answer that question because I think um, the presidency of Gustavo Petro is basically jumping to the unknown. Um, we don't know what's gonna, it, we don't know if, if, if our democracy, if our institutions are gonna uh, resist and are gonna stand against a uh, less populist. Um, we have solid institutions, more solid than what Venezuela had back when Hugo Chavez ro rose to power. But I think we can expect a government such as the Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador government in Mexico a government that is based upon uh, media and pop um, uh, opinion hits and based upon populist speeches about the people and the poor people and the needs of the people and those who are the least benefits of the society. And he's going to rise up his government uh, standing on that platform of populism. And he's going to uh, have really, really bad relations with the press. He's going to constantly attack freedom of speech and freedom of press, and he's going to constantly attack Congress on his on on its political control duty that that is um, awarded in the Constitution. Right, um, as you were saying that, I just remembered something that many people said four years ago, anticipating what a bad government would it be to have Ivan Duque, right, who was running back then against Gustavo Petro, and they said that Petro was not as bad uh, as Duque because he would not have governability, right, because the Congress is not uh, on his side, and, and, and so on. Do you think we could make the same argument uh, now as we did four years regarding that situation? Uh, well, regarding the, the, the governability Gustavo Petro will have, I think, well, you know, the Colombian Congress is not, it's a Congress that is, it can easily be swift through, through different bureaucratic um, uh, gifts the president, the, the president offers to the congressman. So yeah, I think he might have a chance of, of creating that governability using the same old practices as politicians he he rejects uh, do so so yeah i think he's gonna have some governability at the beginning maybe using exactly the same practices that 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 the establishment right now uses to to get the governability and that's of course really cynical of, of his of his part because he's supposedly uh running against that old practices and running against the establishment right um well, this is, maybe this is a complex question and we can split it as, as, as you want, uh, but at least from my perception, my experience, Colombia is a traditionally right, being uh, optimistic center right country, but I would say that that right country. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we are seeing a leftist president win. Uh, th th that, is, that is something I would like to ask you about, what changed? The other thing uh, is not only about the population, right? Because we know that, that Colombian politics, and this is a bit of background for the audience, as you say, do not uh, depend on, on, on citizen opinion, right? It depends on what the parties are able to do. Uh, and we see, or I think maybe Petro is doing something different this time than he did in the past that is actually getting him to win. So beyond, uh, beyond the change and the discontent in people that uh, you already mentioned that people are all tired and just want to change, even if the change is, 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 is this guy who was not liked and is not liked by, by uh, a significant amount of the population. 
Uh, how can we explain that he's winning right now? What is he doing right now that is different? Uh, and how that will that impact his future government if, if he's elected? Yeah, I will divide it into two important points. The first is the COVID happened. Yeah, COVID happened and, and, and COVID led half of the, of the country in under the line of poverty. That's something we, we need to take into account according to official official uh, data half of the country is under the line of poverty after covid we have unemployment back in two digits and that of course swift the people's opinion towards a change yes colombia has been a traditionally right country in in, in in elections and in politics but when you have half of the people in poverty unemployment back in two digits and a government that doesn't know how to execute a successful public policy, um, the people's opinion change. That on that side, and the other side is an strategic decision in the Gustavo Petro's political campaign. He finally accepted that there's no way he can get to the presidency if he doesn't use the traditional methods the establishments have used to get to the presidency. That means making alliances with um, uh, local political leaders that can buy votes, that, that can get people to vote on their um, not that legal offers. And he, he took that, that decision and he he's defending that decision and he's uh, defending that decision through the argument that if we want to change Colombia, we need, need to make an agreement with everyone. And that implies agreeing with those that that um, uses uh, not that legal methods to get a political power. So basically, Gustavo Petro took that decision back when he started his his 2022 campaign, and he realized that there's no way someone can get to the Colombian presidency with uh, only with the with the opinion vote. If you know what I mean to, with that concept, with the the opinion of the people. He needs the the strength of traditional politicians to get to the to the to the to the presidency. Right. Um, and just playing a bit of devil's advocate on that argument, if he's making alliances uh, and concessions to traditional political forces, wouldn't that imply that he also has to moderate or at least I don't know, be a bit flexible on his government plan and the reforms he wants to do to be able to comply what he promised to these parties, or how does that work in terms of governability? Well, the, the traditional political parties in Colombia and the traditional politicians in Colombia are everything but ideologically bound. Uh, so basically, he said for right now, uh, to getting this political traditional, uh, this this political parties and and these traditional politicians, is based upon how many bureaucracy can he give to those politicians when he is president. These agreements are not based upon ideology. These agreements are not based upon, um, yeah, limits, demo democratic limits or, or or democratic red lines. It's hundred percent based on bureaucracy, it's 100% based on, on money and, and, and yeah, clientelistic uh, structures. So I don't think he has to make that much of an effort to moderate his speech to get the political establishment into his campaign because the Colombian political establishment is everything, as I told you, but ideologically bad. Right. Right, and now let's turn to the fear everyone has, right? And let's, I think let's do just to close uh, two exercises. The first one, let's compare Petro to other left leaders in the region, going from Maduro and Ortega to Boric in Chile, who we were discussing a couple of weeks ago, and we think is, if he's successful, could be a very interesting president for, for, the, yeah. for the left in the region. That would be the first one. And then uh, let's compare him to other personalistic leaders in the region, uh, like Bolsonaro, Maduro himself, Ortega, Donald Trump, 
uh, to see uh, similarities and differences. So if you want, let's let's start with with the left uh, with the left leaders, uh, the ones you want. Yeah. Well, basically, everything, everyone here and the and the, the strategy against Petro have been scaring people uh, on how we're gonna become Venezuela if we elect him president. I think that's far from happening. We don't have the resources Venezuela had when Hugo Chavez rose to power. We have a more strong um, institu institutions to fight and to to yeah to fight Gustavo Petro and to fight a government based upon populist idea. And we've seen it with Ivan Duque and we've seen it with Alvaro Uribe who wanted to to reelect for a second time the Constitutional Court. Uh, Court of Justice basically uh, stop his intentions of a second re-election. Uh, so my fear is not Venezuela. I will direct my fear more to Argentina, economically speaking. But comparing Gustavo Petro to other Latin American regions, well, I think Gustavo Petro, and, and I hope I'm not wrong, is not is is not going to become Ortega or Maduro. I think he's going to become more like a Bolsonaro. Uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador style, uh, a, a personalistic, populist, uh, uh, self-centered leader that wants uh, attention and that thinks that governing a country means having high rates of approval. Uh, and I think that's going to be his 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 way of governing Colombia. Um, it's going to hit really hard on democracy as as the Alvaro Uribe government hit. And well, we, we, we were able to, to stand up after the Alvaro Uribe government, but democracy was really, really hurt when he left power. Um, but I think he's not going to be the, the, um, the New Chilean president. I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Uh, Boric. Boric, yeah. He's not going to be Boric. I think Boric is a new left, a more democratic left. Uh, a less m less ideological and more practical, and Gustavo Petro is a really really strong ideological dogmatic person. So I think he's gonna be more uh, populist by the by the Donald Trump, by the Bolsonaro or the Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador side, rather than a left more pragmatic and more democratic. Uh, of for example, I don't know Michelle Bachelet or Boric. We hope. Right, right. Um, and now let's talk about alternatives to, to defeating him, right? Um, is there any way to defeat Petro at this moment in the campaign? Yes, we, we have a really, really remote possibility and that possibility is embodied in two people. I like one better than the other and I, that's Sergio Fajardo, which we just spoke about. Uh, a more um, institutionalized change that the country needs. Uh, if Sergio Fajardo can list his campaign and can begin to talk to people and can begin to interpret people's needs, he might be able to go to the second round with Gustavo Petro and defeat him because the left center and the right center will vote Sergio Fajardo. If Gustavo Petro goes to the second round of elections with uh, Federico Gutierrez, he will win because the left center won't vote for Federico Gutierrez because he is the candidate of the current government and he needs those those votes. And the third person I think can defeat um, Gustavo Petro and I think is also a populist more for the Trump side is Rodolfo Hernandez, the former uh, Santander department gover governor. He has shown to be a populist and an anti-corruption speech that is really empty, but it's a speech that people get really easy because people is really tired. The people, people are really tired of, of, of corruption. I think those are the three main uh, persons. Yeah, Gustavo Petro is running against, and I think Sergio Fajardo and Rodolfo Fernandez can defeat Gustavo Petro. Right, right, uh, and, and and let's speak a bit about alliances. Right uh, here, we have not two, not three, but I don't know. It's like seven presidential mm. candidates at the moment. Do you anticipate any alliance before the first round of elections? Well, I mean, there should be any alliances. Like, for example, Ingrid Betancourt, the former 
um, victim of FARC uh, and former senator who is running for president, but she, she has no chance. I think she might um, support Sergio Fajardo, but I mean, she, she will bring, what, 100,000 votes. That's not, that's not enough to win a presidency. But as things are right now, I think there are going to be not major alliances. Maybe the Liberal Party is, has the presidency on, his, on, on their hands. Cesar Gaviria, the former Colombian president, which is the director of the Liberal Party, has the keys to the presidency, and uh, he's going to need to make a decision of whether he supports Gustavo Petro or Federico Gutierrez to the presidency, and, and that's going to define a lot of things because of the of the amount of political capital he has right now. Right, and, and, and some speculation here. How do you think he's going to play his cards? It depends on what he can get uh, from the candidates. It depends on, on how much power he can, he can accumulate from supporting Federico Gutierrez or Gustavo Petro. I think he's going to end up supporting Gustavo Petro. Right. Uh, and maybe the last question, looking into the future. Uh, what? what do you think, looking into the future, yes. looking into the future, what do you think will be the priorities of any government that wins this election? Uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I will say three important points. First, boosting the economy. We are on a key moment. We are growing economically, but there's going to be an economic crisis and we need to have a solid economy to, to confront the crisis. Second, deepen the peace agreements that Juan Manuel Santos signed back in 2016. And that goes to implementing a successful security policy in Colombia. And third, solving unemployment and poverty. I think those three main, main aspects are the one that, that the next Colombian government needs to focus on. And that goes through a process of deep reforms and deep change in the Congress that I think Gustavo Petro is not going to be able to achieve. And Gutierrez? Uh, I don't know. I, I think he will not have enough will to make them. He, he doesn't want things to change as, 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 as they should be, be changing. And Gustavo Petro presents a really radical change that is not good for the country. Right. Right. Um... And maybe the last question, yep. uh, how do you think either outcome would impact our relationship with the United States and what is the role the United States will play? I think it depends. Government? Yeah, it depends on the next United States government. If we have a Republican populist backed with Donald Trump, I think he's going to be best friends with Gustavo Petro, uh, as, as Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador was with Donald Trump. I think the, the relationship with the United States is going to be really key on the, on the business and economic uh, issues. And if it's a democratic um, president, liberal president, is going to hit really hard with, with Gustavo Petro uh, in really, really different aspects. Right. Alvaro, one last closing remark you would like to make for the U.S. people, for the audience, for the Colombian people. This is just your space uh, to make a closing statement uh, for our viewers to think for the next two weeks. Yes, uh, basically, and I think I speak for the whole world, I think right now we are in a moment where populism is risking liberties, is risking, free, is risking freedom, and is risking democracy. And we uh, in Colombia and the United States, we need to, to, to be strong and, and defend democracy and defend freedom at all costs because we have, we have really struggled to get where we are right now. Thank you so much. I think that goes in the line of the closing remarks of our, of our previous guests uh, so it starts to build up. Uh, this was Latin American Directions. Alvaro Salgado, thank you so much. And we'll keep an eye on the election. And perhaps we'll have you back after thank the Thank you program. very much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'll see you in two weeks.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.